Good afternoon. I'm Jeffrey Archer, Dean of University Libraries, Museums, and the Press. And I am so happy that we are hosting the Office of the Provost, the Office of the Presidents, Readers Meet the Author program. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to read our land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that Baylor University in Waco and its original campus in Independence are on the lands and territories originally occupied by indigenous peoples, including the Waco and Tawakoni of the Wichita and affiliate tribes, the Tonkawa, the Comanche, Karankawa, and Lapan Apache. These indigenous peoples were dispossessed of and removed from their lands over centuries by European colonization and American expansionism. In recognition of these native nations, that these native nations are the original stewards of Bay Baylor's campus locations. The university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities through educational offerings, partnerships, and community service. I'm so glad we are in the library today because when you think about libraries, we think of books and study spaces, but this is really, the libraries are a space to engage with ideas and histories and stories. So it's appropriate that we have spaces like this that offer us an opportunity to do that. Uh, after an introduction by President Livingstone and the question and answers, uh, will there be opportunities to enjoy some more cookies? For those of you who are remote, you're missing something. Uh, and then an opportunity to buy a copy of um, Bastille Day in the back and have your copy signed by Greg Garrett, President Livingstone. Thank you, Dean Archer. It's wonderful to be here with everybody and glad to have some of you online as well as those that are with us here live in the libraries. Uh, we are excited to kick off the Readers Meet the Author series for 23-24. It's kind of hard to say that. It's like, oh my gosh, time is flying by, isn't it? We're in 23-24 already. We actually began this series in 2020 during COVID as a way to bring us together and to celebrate some of the amazing work and writing that our faculty are doing. And so we're really excited to be here today to kick off this year. Uh, this year, we are in this series today, we are featuring Dr. Greg Garrett to discuss his novel, Bastille Day. This is actually the very first novel we've ever featured in this series. We've done all academic books up to this point. Uh, so that will be an interesting part of this conversation. Uh, Greg has lent his tremendous talents and pr perspectives to our campus community in very many ways. Over the years, he uh, included a panel on our converse conversation series on civil discourse back several years ago. That might have been in 2020 as well. I believe it was. And he is the, the key organizer of an annual conference on racism in the white church that we host on an annual basis a prolific essayist, a distinguished preacher and preaching scholar, a cultural critic. Uh, he has audiences in all types of places uh, that uh, value what he has to say and his perspectives on things. He has a book called The Courage to See that I've used a lot in reflection, and it's got great quotes in it that I use fairly regularly in some of my speeches as well. Uh, uh, Dr. Garrett is the Carol McDaniel Hanks Chair of Literature and Culture, and he has been here since 1989. He has five novels, so this is not his first novel, and two dozen books on race, culture, and theology. Uh, he also, and you'll notice this if you read the book, uh, serves as the canon theologian at the American Cathedral of the Holy Trinity in Paris. He lives in Austin with his wife and two daughters. He is joined by Dr. Ron Johnson, the Ralph and Bessie May Lynn Chair of History here at Baylor. Dr. Johnson's research embraces a transnational approach to African-American history in the early United States with specializations in diplomacy, race, and religion. He is also an author of note himself and is working currently on a book on a racialized U.S. relations with Haiti during the American Revolution, which should be fascinating. We'll have to bring you back as the writer and not the interviewer in the future. Uh, so I was traveling this week, so I took a copy of Bastille Day with me, and it was my airplane reading over the last few days. It's an amazing book. I recommend it highly to everyone. Uh, there is a line in the last chapter that says, when I began this story, I promised a tale that was com complicated and difficult and beautiful. And it, it that is a very true testament to this book. It's a lot more than that. I actually was afraid people were going to see me crying on the plane as I was reading it at different points in time. It's just a powerful, moving story. And we are really honored 
uh, to have Dr. Johnson and Dr. Garrett here today to talk about it. So I'm going to turn this over to you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, President Livingstone. And thank you so much to everyone who's joined us both here in the room and online. I want to, I just cannot say enough about how joyful I am to be here. And I use the term joy because Greg, in addition to being a phenomenal writer, is just one of the most beautiful human beings I've had the chance to know. And you know, as President Livingstone just talked about his long list of writing, I have been not only a benefactor of his friendship and his brotherhood, um, but he's also, he's always encouraging me in my own writing. And so I'm just very blessed to be here. And I wanna thank, thank you for this opportunity. This book, this book took me on a journey. Uh, not only did it take me on a journey to this wonderful city that we're gonna talk about in detail here in a minute, but there was a journey of love, of loss, of faith, community, of memory. And it really put me in the minds of some of the, some writers that I've read recently. And I, I, I wanna give just a quick shout out here to my 11th grade English teacher who gave me a love of fiction. And Greg, as I read this book, I, I thought about the work of Kate Quinn in The Rose Code, um, the, the American Library, Janet Charles's, the, the American Library and the Last Bookshop in London. This is a really wonderful work. And so as I, as I there are a lot of writers in this room. There are a lot of writers um, who are joining us, but many of us are not fiction writers. So why don't we just start this conversation off? How do you write a novel in general? And in, and in particular, how did you come to write this novel? That, I mean, um, Ron, first, thank you so much uh, for being here. Uh, for those of you who are watching here and online, um, my friend Ron is not actually on the Baylor campus this fall. Uh, he's coming up today to do some special things, and this is one of those special things, and, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, that is such an interesting question because... Um, my writing career has been sort of all over the place, and I hope in a good way, um, not in a, you know a random sort of way, because there there are things that connect everything that I do. Um, you know, there are, are things that I care deeply about, issues and um, uh, different sorts of uh, things that are part of the human experience that matter to me, whether I'm writing nonfiction or fiction. Um, but the fact that there are five novels and two dozen nonfiction books tells you a couple of things. Um, and first, I do not in any way want to diminish uh, people who write solely nonfiction. Uh, I find nonfiction to be easier. Um, not that it's easy. The James Baldwin book that came out a couple of weeks ago, I spent six years working on. Um, but what I notice about this, and perhaps this is true for you as a historian, is that um, what I'm trying to do is to learn everything I can to gather everything that's pertinent to structure it in such a way that um, it tells a story because I always want to tell a story when I write. But fiction comes from someplace else and there's gathering that goes along with it, but you don't know that you're necessarily doing gathering. Uh, and so I was mentioning to President Livingston uh, before we started, um, there is a character in my Baylor past uh, who is the model for the female romantic lead in this book, Nadia. Um, and my Nadia, whose name was actually Nadia, was from Saudi Arabia. And she was facing the same dilemma. Her parents had sent her to Baylor, um, partly for the great education and partly to increase her marriage value. And uh, she spent a considerable amount of time weeping in my office. Um, and she was one of the first Baylor students that I did pastoral counseling with. Back before I went to seminary, that was one of the things that I started to realize is, hey, this is one of the reasons I'm here. But Nadia had this choice. And as I said uh, a second ago, no 19 year old would be placed in this position where either she has to marry someone she doesn't know or ruin her family. And I didn't realize that when this happened, which was probably 20 years ago now, this was gonna be one of the central things that this book was about. Um, 
you know, brilliant young woman who didn't have the agency to control her own life. Um, but it's one of the things that I filed away, you know, in the in the fiction file cabinet, so to speak. And then there are other things that began to come together around this. The book, of course, is called Bastille Day. And the primary reason for that is because it centers around uh, the Bastille Day terror attack in Nice. And I knew somehow after that event, because I was in Paris on the tower in the American Cathedral on that day, and we came down from watching fireworks and got the news from Nice. And so we've been up, um, I'm gonna use the word exhilarating. The passage I'm gonna read later is more like terrifying, but we had been up in the space and watching the fireworks off the Eiffel Tower and celebrating. And then we came down to this news, which is so familiar to us um, today when we're looking at, um, at similar kinds of news of terrorism. And so I knew that I wanted to write something about, um, about that event and about how people dealt with that event. But the other really important thing about writing a novel is that novels are not about ideas and they're not necessarily about events. They're about people. And so you have to find the people who are going to inhabit those things. And so I knew that Nadia was going to be a character, but I knew that I didn't want to try and write from her perspective. There were too many parts of her lived identity that I didn't share. Uh, I did not want to be disrespectful in any way. Um, what I am really good at is writing about tortured white guys. <laughs> and so I said, I will, I will find a white guy and I will torture him until he's ready to narrate this book. And that's that's exactly what happened. Uh, so I, I found a character and I had to think about how, how would he fit into all of this? And so I made him a TV journalist. Uh, I made him a, a correspondent, a national correspondent during the Iraq war. Um, I broke him and my students think this is so funny when I just talk matter of factly about doing this to characters. It's a thing that writers do. Um, Kurt Vonnegut used to say that the problem with many beginning writers is that they are too nice mm. to their characters. And if I'm going to write a novel, if I'm going to spend six years, five, six years on a story, the stakes have got to be high. I mean, it's got to be life or death, you know, physically, emotionally, spiritually. And so all of those things kind of came together. I found my narrator. I found the set of things that would make him work. I put him in close proximity with Nadia, who I already loved, and he began to love her. And then all of a sudden, we've got a ticking clock because uh, as people who have read the book know, and as it says on the back jacket, um, he falls in love with this woman who is supposed to be married at the end of the week in Paris. I mean, you, you know, that description of being too nice to your characters is the mark of a young writer, a new writer. You are definitely not a new writer because your characters go through some things in this book. And so and you mentioned Bastille Day, right? I just want to preface this question by saying the worst place to be, um, you, know, you know, the worst place to be standing is outside of a movie theater like Oppenheimer when historian walks out. <laughs> because all we're about to do is criticize everything that is not historically correct in the book, right? I mean, in, the book. Well, in this book, there are multiple very real historical events. Bastille Day is one of them that you described. There are several others. And as a, I, when I read the book, I really try to read fiction as a reader. Like I, I try to, I love where I let the author take me places. Well, I'm not, I don't have to go back to your footnotes and see, you know, I really enjoy this work. I mean, I enjoyed the work of fiction, but your historical research, I found as a historian, I found it to be compelling. I found it to be um, not just accurate, but it, it, it was a part, these were really vital parts to the story. How did you take us through your historical method? Like, how, how did you how did you do your historical research? And and much of what Ron is talking about is uh, has to do with uh, Calvin, my narrator, and his time yeah. in Iraq. Um, and the the problem that I faced in writing this novel is that I I think of myself as a, a literary realist. It is very rare that I don't write about a place that I have been on the ground, you know, streets that I have walked, restaurants that I have eaten at. Uh, almost everything that is in this book is a place that I have been, you know, there, uh, you know, I, I have not actually jumped into the sun, but I have stood on the bridge looking at it and going, that is so far down. 
somebody would really have to be, you know, desperate to jump off, and someone that would have to be something else to jump off after her. Um, so the big problem for me is that I, I was not in Fallujah during the Iraq war, and I will probably never be in Fallujah if my wife has anything to say about it. And so what I had to do was I had to go and completely recreate Calvin's experience there. Um, who did he know? What were the stories? Uh, and, and for me, particularly since I am a realist, I had to know the sensory details. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what was it like to be in 119, 120 degree heat day after day after day? Uh, what was it like to eat, you know, uh, you know, army rations day after day? Um, let's just say that they, they were well known for causing physical distress. <laughs> um, but that if you don't do the necessary research, then you don't know about the human experience of the characters. And so um, I did a ton of reading um, in uh, journalism, in uh, books written by uh, veterans, uh, and uh, interestingly, a chaplain uh, in Iraq. Uh, I read a bunch of the sort of, you know, 30,000 foot histories, but what I really relied on were the personal stories. And then I actually interviewed uh, a couple of people who had been in Iraq, uh, a person who had been an army chaplain in Iraq, who's now an Episcopal priest, and uh, John Burnett from NPR, uh, who had been a correspondent in Iraq. And to get, to get those details and to get them right was essential. Um, I couldn't inhabit Calvin until I had done that work. work. And um, so that, that was the biggest thing. Whenever I write a novel, I always want to learn something. And I, I sort of set that out as a side goal for myself. It's like, I want to write the very best story that I can. Um, but I, I don't want to just revisit stuff that I already know. So the novel that I just sent off, I don't remember if I told you the other day, but it's it's about an oncologist. And so I had to study oncology. You know, uh, I had to look at cancer protocols. I had to uh, interview uh, oncologists. I shadowed one. Um, and so it was like, this is the thing I'm going to learn. So that was my thing to learn in Bastille Day. You know, I knew what Paris looked like. I knew um, where Hemingway used to sit in Harry's New York bar. Uh, but I didn't know about Fallujah until I did all of that work. And until I had done all that work, I couldn't write. And, and I, Greg, I don't know if you know this, and you don't need my affirmation, but as someone who served in Saudi Arabia during the first Gulf War, I really connected with the characters and the veterans in your piece. And I want to thank you so much for the care that you took in describing them. Well, we've talked about how beautiful the book is. Would you mind just sharing a part of it with us to show, you know, what a wonderful I, writer you I'd are and, and talk a little bit about the section you're going to choose? Let me, let me do a quick setup for that, because first... Um, I'm going to read from the middle of the book, which is something novelists almost never do. Uh, typically, you start toward the very beginning uh, so that people are all on the same page. But okay. since people can read the back you know, copy and read on Amazon a lot of the plot, um, it doesn't, you know, I think, go too far in revealing that, you know, here's a man who's fallen in love with a woman. Um, and uh, there are complications. Um, so I, I want to read a section that's set in the American Cathedral. And would you mind, as a as a good Baptist, if you give me the page number, yeah. I'm going to go there with you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I'm I'm going to start on page 135, and I'm going to skip a tiny bit here and there just to maximize our time. Um, but basically, what you need to know is this: uh, the first and most important thing is that Calvin, like I am, is terrified of heights. And for his first job at his new station in Paris, he's being asked uh, to go up on the highest church tower in Paris to cover the fireworks. And uh, his boss, who has not realized that he is like terrified of heights, this is this is a big complication. Uh, and then uh, the other thing that you probably need to know is that before he goes up, they're at a party in the courtyard, and he and Nadia have um, what is kind of their first argument. Uh, because she has worn her engagement ring. Uh, it was sort of a condition of her future and mother-in-law, like, I'm not letting you out of the apartment, you know, naked. Uh, and it is one of those, uh, you know, like, 
Richard Burton engagement rings. Okay. Um, and there is a place in the book where he talks about the one third carat diamond ring that uh, his father gave to his mother. This is, let's say, a nine carat ring. And he gets really upset because he realizes, I mean, in a kind of existential way, that love or no love, he's never going to be able to give her the things that this person in Saudi Arabia could give her. And she says, hold on to it. So he puts it in his pocket. He starts up the stairs. Uh, and then the last thing I have to say, because my president, my provost are sitting in front of me, although the president and I actually watched a Spike Lee film together a couple of years ago. And, and the, the earth continued to rotate. Um, but there is a... And you still have a job. I still have a job. There's, a, there's an ongoing gag in, in the book. Um, Calvin is a person who has faith in almost nothing at this point, but every now and then he will use the name of our Lord and Savior. And uh, his uh, uncle, Jack, and his wife, uh, will, who are good Southern Baptists from Fort Worth, will say, don't blaspheme. So you need to know that. Okay. I took a step onto the staircase and started spiraling up again. This is the middle of 135, Ron. <laughs> Most of me was shaking by the time I was 20 feet up. I closed my eyes, held one hand on the railing, used the other to pull myself up. I heard voices from below, then closer. Is this it? Someone was asking beneath me, and I thought I heard James, the American ambassador, answer in the affirmative. Come on, I told myself, come on. Shame and terror were fighting for supremacy. I chanced to look up. I didn't dare look down and opened my eyes. I was close. A few more circuits, and I could see the outline of the door leading outside. I was close. I eased myself up step by step. Rob had done this. Ahmed had done it. I could do it too. You're almost there, Rob called just above me, almost up. I gained the wrought iron landing, maybe the most welcome way station I had ever known, and looked out through the door at the city beyond, or more precisely at the roofs and towers of Paris, for we were high, high above the city. The limestone railing beyond came up to my waist, maybe. I poked my head through the door, saw the two foot or less passageway between wall and railing, and saw that we were on the opposite side from the Eiffel Tower where we needed to be to shoot the fireworks. Come on, Rob said, beckoning me out. Absolutely not, I said. Come on, he said. He squeezed through a little alcove and called back to me. Just right through here. It's a great shot. Nope, I said. My hands held white knuckled to the door frame. I couldn't go out and I couldn't go in. I was stuck. I would remain here for the rest of my days. I would die on this way. <laughs> Voices approached from below. Two dozen people had been at the party, but maybe not all of them were coming up. Perhaps Nadia was staying below. I brushed at my pocket at the substantial heft of her engagement ring. It would serve everyone right if I didn't survive this. Unquelli squeezed past me. Pardon, little man, he said in French, with Clarice just behind him. Isn't it an amazing view, she asked, and did not wait for my reply. She and Inquelli went left in the opposite direction and squeezed through the alcove at the other corner. I can't do it, Rob, I called. I'm sorry, but I can't. It's a one-minute read, Cal. Seriously, intro and outro, that's all. We'll have you back down the stairs in three minutes. I chanced to look down into the city. Oh, such a mistake. I had to sit down on the top step. My legs could not be trusted. Jesus, I said. I wanted to weep. Do not blaspheme, came the still small voice beside me as Nadia made her way up the last few stairs, both her own hands white knuckled on the rail. I didn't think you were coming, I said. Nor did I, she said. We share this kryptonite, Calvin. Her head was rigid, eyes now looking directly into mine and nowhere else. Oh my God, I said, Nadia, take my hand. Her right hand shot forward and I grabbed it. We stood at the door, opening out onto the observation deck. I thought the wall would be higher, she said. I know, I said, it's a travesty. <laughs> Cal, Rob called from the corner, I need you now. I can't do it, I said. I turned to Nadia. I'm so sorry, I said to her in Arabic. You shouldn't have come. I shouldn't have come. But here we are, she said. And you have a job to do.
She indicated the door with her head. I can't, I said. She stepped through the doorway, put both hands against the railing in front of her, nodded, took a deep breath, and slid right one step. Yes, you can, she told me. And then I'm going to jump over just a page or so, because this is maybe the most important part of this. With Nadia's help, he's able to sort of creep around the tower. And folks, believe me, if you are afraid of heights, it is just terrifying. And so this is the bottom of 138 bucks. Look at me, she said. Just look at me. Calvin, she said, I have realized something. If we let fear stop us from living, we are already dead. It sounded as if she was speaking as much to herself as to me. The blessed Quran says that for those who believe, on them shall be no fear, neither shall they grieve. Calvin, I will believe for you, you, Nadia said, squeezing hard, until the time you can believe for yourself. Thank you. I, I, I will say, you know, Dr. Livingstone confessed to almost crying. Um, this is one of my favorite parts of the book because um, I couldn't help but think about my own wife and the way in which she helps me get through things that I couldn't get without her. And so there were multiple times when I walked away from the book, like, wow, what an experience I just had. And that was a very powerful one. Thank you so much for sharing that. Well, you're so welcome. And I, and I wanted to read this thing that's halfway through. Um, in terms of story structure, most long narratives have what's called a, a midpoint crisis. It's, it's the place in the story where either something really good happens or something really bad happens. But in general terms, it's the place where the hero or heroine is tested and we see possibility. So this is a character who is so driven by fear, you know, fear, particularly of loss. He's lost so much. If he loses more, he's afraid he won't survive it. And here is this thing uh, that Nadia says, the quote from the Quran, which is a quote she uses later on in the book in a fraught moment. Um, and I really do love that I will believe for you. Um, my dear friend Hewlett Blower, uh, the former homiletics professor at our Truett Seminary, um, he and I have uh, done plenty of work together and we used to teach a Jan term class together for the seminary that Ralph West and I now teach together. And he talked to uh, our students every year about the Book of Common Prayer. And most of our students are Baptist seminarians. Some of them are Baptist pastors. They're not typically, you know, connoisseurs of the Book of Common Prayer. But, but Hewlett talked about a time in his life when he was suffering from serious depression and his prayer life had gone absolutely dry. And he said, these prayers prayed for me when I could not pray for myself. And I've always remembered that and just kind of stole it a little bit, which is another thing that writers do. <laughs> Steal from really smart people. Yeah. So I so this the in the passage you read, like on that tower, you've been on that tower. Like in this book, yeah. the American Cathedral plays a central role in many ways. Yeah. You've been there, you've preached there. Would you talk about the importance of the cathedral in the book itself, but also how your experience? in lived experiences within the cathedral shaped its construction in the book. It is very interesting. I had not expected to write about the American cathedral, uh, but it's a place that I've lived for probably eight or nine months over the last 10 years. Um, I spend time there every summer. Uh, it's time there every advent. And uh, so it's, it's a place that I know very well, and it's become maybe my most important like community of faith in the world. And so there have been uh, really traumatic times when something has happened in my family or I've lost someone that I love and I've been far, far away from home. And that's been the community that's reached out to me. Um, and so gradually I realized that I was probably gonna end up writing about the cathedral because I knew it so well. And because I had a character who was suffering a crisis of fear and faith. And uh, he needed to find a group of people who would love him and support him and help him move past this. 
And so uh, to my great surprise, I ended up sort of populating the novel with characters who are part of the American cathedral. Uh, I created a new dean of the cathedral, uh, Clarice Washington, who's an African-American priest from Alpharetta, Georgia. Um, the uh, former dean of the cathedral, uh, who was a white woman from Louisville, uh, was all for me writing this book. And this is just a fun thing I'll tell you, and then I'll come back to that. Um, she said, I would love for you to write about a dean of the cathedral. I mean, do that. But please give her a smoking hot boyfriend. <laughs> like, all right. Deal. Uh, so enter in Quelle, you know, diplomat from Cameroon. Um, by far the best looking man in the book. Uh, and I think that that was, that was pleasant for her. So here is the thing. The, the, the cathedral ends up being important in terms of the characters who, who go there, but in terms of the faith that they embody. And um, one of the things that I had not expected also is that the climax of the book is an actual sermon. I am always telling my students don't preach it. But there, there are exceptions to every artistic rule. And in particular, a speech or a sermon is a valuable thing if it's got dramatic content to it. If it's got, you know, dramatic tension embedded in it. And so what I did was I, I rewrote the sermon that I actually gave in the cathedral on the National Day of Remembrance after the Bastille Day attack. Um, maybe the most difficult preaching assignment I've ever had. And I went to Lucinda on several occasions. I said, you should preach this. And she said, no, you got it. I don't got it. And the gospel lesson for that day is Mary and Martha. It's not a natural, you know, sort of speaking into that space sort of thing. Um, but by kind of living into Clarice's lived experience and to her history, uh, it became a thing about the radical message of love and acceptance that Jesus lived. Um, and so Scenes are set at the cathedral, you know, uh, the dean, members of the vestry or characters, and then this sort of transformative worship service. Uh, the sermon turns out to be really important in Calvin's movement. Um, and then after it's over, because we're Episcopalian, they take the Eucharist. And Cal doesn't know what he meant, what it means. You know, like, like me, he grew up Southern Baptist. It was, you know, the little grape juice things, you know. Um, <laughs> And I tried to get more than one. <laughs> they always frowned on this. Um, and he doesn't know what it means. And um, he's in the pew with a friend who says, it's a gift for the brokenhearted, uh, which is what it has been for me in the darkest times of my life. Um, so I am grateful to the cathedral for the relationship that I've had with them. Um, much of this book, it's not going to be surprising, was written while I was in residence at the cathedral. Um, and then the fun thing, I'll just mention this. Uh, I think you know this, but I finished this book in the village in Switzerland where James Baldwin finished his first novel. Um, and that was the coolest thing. It's a good place to write. I'll just put that on your plate. Excellent. So faith is a huge part of this, but it doesn't just come up in the end, right? It doesn't just conclude there. And, and I will say, it, you're not, I, don't, I didn't find it preachy at all. I mean, you did a really good job with that. I, want, I would like you to talk about the complex way that you address faith, the Christian faith, the Muslim faith. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to read uh, one sentence, a question that comes out on Bastille or after Bastille Day. Uh, Cal is talking to a, uh, he's interviewing a lady about what happened. And she asked this question, how could one of us do this horrible thing? Yeah. Talk about the way you address faith in this book. Well, it is, I think, a human essential, um, and not everybody is recognizably a person of faith, but we are all spiritual beings, uh, and, and I believe very deeply, you know, that when Augustine said that we are all created with a God-shaped hole uh, that we try to fill in various ways, um, but that, that is a part of the human condition. We are all seeking something that's transcendent, something that will give us meaning, um, and there's, there's good faith and there's destructive faith in this novel. And one of the things that Calvin wrestles with is that during his time in Iraq, uh, his father, who was a career non-com, 
uh, was killed in a marketplace bombing, and his driver and best friend was killed in, uh, well, actually was killed in a marketplace bombing, and his father was killed uh, in, a, in a similar way. And so Calvin has suffered like horrendous losses at the hands of Islamic terrorists. And Nadia is herself a devout Muslim, but she is very clear with Calvin. These people do not represent my faith. And one of the biggest uh, fights that they have is after Calvin comes back from covering the Bastille Day event. And he is transported back into his trauma. And he is so furious. Um, and one of the sort of mysteries in the book is what happens to his driver. And the flashback is finally revealed in uh, the time when he is uh, in Nice. And it's horrific. Uh, and you can sort of understand why he is so badly scarred by this. But one of the things that Nadia does is she represents an authentic faith um, that is not uh, turned toward terror. Yeah. And because I'm living with Baldwin a lot right now as well, I'm getting asked about, you know, what did Baldwin think about faith? And while Baldwin left the established church as a young man, he understood that faith had intrinsic value for people but that a, a truly valuable faith was one that was driven by love, uh, not by hatred. And that's what he comes to learn, I think, during the course of this novel. And part of it he learns from Nadia, uh, who represents her faith so faithfully. And part of it is from these good people at the cathedral. Um, and uh, I, I came to love the dean of the cathedral, Clarice, um, I gave her a bad habit. Like she's, we encounter her one time. She's out on the front steps of the cathedral, like surreptitiously smoking. And uh, this is not something that Lucinda, our former dean, ever did. But I just thought, yeah, this is this is something Clarice would do. Um, and she's also very matter of fact about you know what what faith does for you and what it doesn't. And uh, so she invites him to come to that service. And says, I know that you have not had good experiences with faith in the past, but just come. There are a lot of people who do not consider themselves religious who are going to be in this space on Sunday. And when you were mentioning, you know, Khalil, right, and the way in which he remembers Khalil, right, it happens in a moment that he's not expecting to think about Khalil, right? Something yeah. happens, uh, he sees something, it triggers the memory. And throughout the book, you, you remind us that the things we've lived through, they stay with us and they, they reappear in moments, in these unexpected moments. And one part of the book that I did not see coming, if you will, was the relationship, the way you handle the relationship between Cal Jr. and Cal Sr., do you want you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I would love to talk about that because that was something that surprised me as well. Um, what's happened with each of my novels is that there have been characters who I've introduced and I thought that was like their, you know, cameo and they were never going to, you know, walk back on stage. Uh, so there were like the, the grandparents in my second novel, Cycling. They just kept showing up and kept showing up and being smart and funny. And so I had to keep bringing them back. And what I came to realize is that Cal Sr. is the great loss, you know, and those two losses in Iraq were huge, but Cal is a first person narrator in this book. Uh, and, and four of my five novels have been told in first person. I love first person. Uh, I believe there's an, an immediacy to the narration and we get entry to the thoughts, memories, and even phrasing of, of the character who's the most important person in the book. And Cal says early on that he's promising to tell the truth, that, that he's gonna be a truthful narrator. And then twice during the book, he has to stop himself and say, I have failed you. I am trying to tell you about my father. I want you to love him. And I want to love him too. And I realized that this was maybe, maybe even more than the love story, which was the initial reason for my writing the book. This relationship and the, the trauma of you know, losing his father and the relationship that they didn't have. Um, and this is not a spoiler because you don't, it doesn't depend on your knowing about the relationship between Calvin and his father, but 
there's a, a flashback late in the book where he talks about one of the last times that he saw his father before he and his father went overseas um, and how they could not connect with each other. Like just, they were sitting in the same room, but they could not find something to talk about. And at last his father says, well, I'm sure you have places you need. And that was their relationship. Um, so it turned out to be hard, very hard. Uh, and and I, I, I'm always very clear about this. There are autobiographical elements to everything that I write. That's not an autobiographical element. You know, my, my father was not abusive. He did not die in Iraq. Uh, he's 84 years old. He's still running 5K races and winning them. He's the only person <laughs> in his class. <laughs> but um, I know my, my parents got divorced when I was young. And I never had a relationship with him like you would have with the father that you live with, you know. And I've spent my entire life looking for fathers. And it has often led me into terrible rooms. Uh, because you look for somebody to fill that hole. And um, so what I, I love about the character of Calvin Sr. is that even though he's difficult and abusive, um, we know where his heartbreak comes from. Um, and there's, there's a humanity to him. He's not a cardboard villain. Um, and, and that's my goal with all of these characters, you know, to give them their, their full humanity. Um, and often when I read from the book, I'll read one of those flashback sections. They were the hardest to write, by far the hardest, even though it's not my lived experience. Uh, it, it broke my heart. And, you know, Dr. Livingstone was talking about weeping on the plane or not weeping on the plane. Um, there is a saying among creative writers, no tears in the writer, no tears in the reader. And please believe me when I say that I have spent full hours just bawling my eyes out uh, writing some of those things. When you when you were talking when I was reading that section that you mentioned where they see each other and and they don't connect, I the the song of Reba McIntyre, who I'm not going to sing it, but she says the greatest man, the greatest man that I never knew lived just down the hall. I mean, I, and and um. Throughout this book, there are literature and cultural references that I found, they were markers, right? And it really allowed me to connect uh, with the story, with the characters, because they I'd shared some of those literary moments yeah. and things like that. How did that, what was, you know, how did those literary moments, Bono, you know, Ian Fleming, you know, uh, I mean, how did that help what was their role in the book? Well, the thing about um, a, a text or a story or a work of art that you bring into your narrative is that it becomes a, an extra textual marker. Um, and if your reader knows some of these markers and what they convey, then there's a kind of emotional shorthand that's attached to it. So we know that the father listened to Frank Sinatra. Um, and, and Cal thought that was so uncool. And this actually is autobiographical. My father belonged to the Columbia Record Club and he got a record every month and they were the worst records ever. You know, so 12 year old me is looking at his records from the early 1960s and the best record, and this was actually a great record, was Nat King Cole, who I have a lifelong love for. But the rest was like, you know, the Montalbani strings play the Beatles. <laughs> and so, you know, young, young Cal, is listening to his, you know, his mom and dad <laughs> listening to Frank Sinatra, and he thinks it's the, the uncoolest thing ever. And then he realizes at one point, his father says, those were my father's records. And you realize that the issue that he had with his father is an issue that his father had with his father, who was also abusive. Um, and so, you know, those, those sad, from Sinatra songs. Uh, there was a point at which this book was called, instead of Bastille Day, it was called In the Wee Small Hours, which is one of the saddest pop songs ever recorded. In the wee small hours of the morning, that's the time he was her most of all. 
So for everybody who has had a hard night, as Mr. Hemingway said, it is easy to be hard boiled in the daytime, but at night it is a different matter. Well, I get what I think I'm gonna do one last question before we open it up to the room and to our uh, the folks listening in. And it comes at the end. And I, I, want, I wanted to know, what do you want us to take away from this? Uh, it, near, the end of the, near the end of the book, you asked, or Cal asked the question, what does a happy ending even mean? Um, my screenwriting class talked with the great screenwriter, Jim Hart, on Tuesday uh, via Zoom. President, I did not use the university resources to bring him in. Um, <laughs> But uh, Jim is one of the, the great storytellers that I know. Uh, he wrote uh, Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula. He went from that set to work with Steven Spielberg on Hook. He went from that set to work with um, Zemeckis on Contact. Um, and Contact, I think, is a great read. That's Jody Foster and the young Matthew McConaughey. Uh, also about faith and doubt and fear um, and fathers. But uh, one of the things that Jim and I often talk about, we do a lot of events together for the Austin Film Festival. And because he's such an authority on story, he often uh, is asked to talk about structure. And uh, one of the things that he learned from Francis Ford Coppola is this thing about the ending. It doesn't have to be a happy ending. It has to be a satisfying ending. And so plenty of people have said to me, no spoilers here, but I wanted the book to end differently. And I said, so did I. But that's not how it ends. Mm -hmm. That's not how these characters move into the next right. piece of their life. And so if you've written a story well, if you've prepared for it, then even if people are initially surprised or unsatisfied by your ending, they're like, this is the only way it could have happened. Um, and so I, I think about Jim Hart's is this a satisfying ending as the, as the thing I lean into for every long narrative. Uh, and, and the other thing that's really important, I wrote lots of short stories when I first came to Baylor. That's how I learned my craft. You don't learn how to plot by writing a short story. If you're a literary writer, it's like a thing happens and then a symbol is it's like your last paragraph. And then the sun went down, <laughs> you know, the end. Yeah. And you're just like, but what? <laughs> When you write a long narrative, when people have written along with you for 300 pages or for two hours in a theater, they, they want completion. And, and you don't have to do Dickens. You know, you don't have to like go down through the next three generations and talk about everything that happened to them. But, but there have to be plot resolutions and they have to be satisfying resolutions. And that is the thing that has taken me longest to learn. And I think I'm finally getting it 20 some years after I started writing novels. Um, but but thank you for asking. I, I love the ending of this book. It it hurts my heart because I love these characters so dearly. Uh, and, and here's one other thing I will tell you. Um, I miss them yeah. every day. It is such a strange and probably psychotic thing to say in front of your bosses. But you live with these characters in your head. And in their own way, they're as real as the life away from your desk. You know, so if I spend eight hours and I am living in their world, you know, I am sitting with them and hearing them talk and hurting when they hurt. And um, finishing a novel is this sort of postpartum depression. You know, you send your baby out or you send her off to college. I know somebody who did that recently. And you're just like, it, it hurts that these people are not a part of my life. And, and that's why being able to talk about them with you today is so gratifying. Um, thank you. And with great love, I want to say the ending, the middle, and the beginning are all satisfying and left me wanting more. Would you guys help me thank Greg for this wonderful book and for being with us today? Christina, are we doing yes. questions from the floor? Well, questions from the floor, yes. So we just wanted to give everybody a chance to ask Greg Garrett some questions. Anybody have a question for him? Well, you, you'll probably like this one. Okay. I, I hope so. You know, when I think of the articles that we see as we monitor the state of higher education and the role of utility and skill sets, 
Um, how would I would like for you to to offer an articulation of of the role of of fiction in creating men and women um, with the ability to serve our world and, and lead? Great art is for um, it's not utilitarian in the sense that it you know teaches us how to code, you know, or to solve an equation or, or something like that. But great art teaches us something about what needs to be needed. And great stories allow us to inhabit the lives of other people in ways that expose us to this range of opportunity. Um, and, and so we get to see moral choices being made and consequences of them. Uh, we get to see what courage looks like lived out in the life. Uh, we get to see what sacrifice looks like. And so in, in a very real sense, you know, you can uh, ask like the corporate versions. But a, a great story is its own historical version. Uh, because we learn all of the essential things that it takes us to be fully human. And how we live with each other and how we try to live for something bigger than ourselves, a cause that we can uh, establish a, a, a people with and a creator. You know, that, that God shaped whole we were talking about. Um, and, and so great art works on all of these dimensions. Um, and it, it allows us to to oh yes, I could to to experience these things without necessarily even leaving, you know, our chair. Um, so I, I, I know that uh, school boards and, and colleges are cutting back on things that don't seem strictly utilitarian. Um, but at Baylor, we know we have always believed in the power of a liberal arts education and the, the power of art, the power of story are a central part of what we do in that education. So, Greg, knowing that you lived in an apartment in the tower, is it, wasn't your apartment in the tower? So did you have to, to, I mean, how scary is it going back and forth every day with the groceries and such to that apartment? All right, so Ella Pritchard is asking um, about the tower apartment 63 steps up from the pavement. Uh, it is a spiral staircase, and so you can't see, except there are these little cutout windows, you know, that look like, you know, you're going to fire arrows on an attacker. Uh, so if you don't look out the window, then all you have to do is deal with the the altitude and the attitude, because they're very steep steps. And uh, so the, the scariest part of it is not the everyday, although you do think twice. It's like, do I really need to go outside today? Or could I just stay up here? But the, the really hard thing is when you're taking your bags up or down the 63 steps. And um, I was, you know... 2013 was the first year that I spent time in that apartment. I was younger, younger, fitter, probably better looking, but the bags have gotten heavier is what I notice. So that's, that's the hardest part. Uh, but it's also really cool because um, to live in the cathedral community, you know, I can, I can walk down those 63 stairs and into the nave of the cathedral. I can, um, you know, spend time in front of the triptych at the altar. There's a 14th century uh, altarpiece in one of the chapels. I mean, it's just to be surrounded by history and beauty in that way. Uh, it, it beats every Airbnb that I know about. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Rivera, and I'm really thankful to be here with you today. I wanted to ask you about um, when did you discover writing, and um, how did that story influence your teaching? Um, I've been writing my entire since you um, So I learned to read when I was two. And um, my parents used to think it was so funny, you know, guests would come over to the house and I would be sitting at the table reading the newspaper and they would say, isn't that cute? He's pretending to read the newspaper. And then I would read the newspaper to them. So the first stories that I wrote were when I was about four years old and they were mostly about firefighters and astronauts. 
Uh, I thought that that was my career path. Um, but I have always told stories and I've always wanted to write stories. I wrote my first novel when I was in high school and it was terrible and derivative and deservedly lost. Um, but one of the things that, that has really mattered is that I knew that this was always a part of who I was and that expressing that part of myself was an essential um, thing to my health, you know, to, and, and you know, I, I think a lot of these days in terms of calling, you know, what it is that we're planted in, on this planet to do that nobody else can do as well as we do. Um, and, and so I think that one of those things is to inhabit stories, to tell stories and to encourage other people to tell stories. Um, so the way that it's shaped my teaching is in two ways. Um, I try and teach my classes in such a way that there's a, a sort of narrative structure to it. Uh, you could also maybe call it a liturgical structure, but, you know, it, it sort of follows that, you know, it builds and we conclude and, you know, we have a blessing and we send people out into the world. Um, so so just the, the sort of recognition of how stories are structured has, has helped me think about how I want to teach. Um, but also, particularly since I was hired originally to be Baylor's fiction writer, uh, which is 34 years ago. Um, so even though I'm not a fiction writer every day, um, I do still teach uh, writing classes. I'm teaching screenplay this semester. And it's an obvious sort of fit to, you know, pull stories out of people who know that that's what they bought into. But in every class I teach, the stories of my students are essential and that we share them with each other and that we become a community. Um, that loves each other and supports each other and challenges each other. Um, it, it all has to come out of shared story. Um, your willingness to share your story with somebody is, it takes courage. But in a, in a setting like we can create at Baylor where it's a safe space and people know that they're loved, appreciated, valued, um, everybody's story can be heard and everybody's story can matter. And, and that's, I think, maybe the most important thing um, if people think about me after I retire from Baylor, I would like for them to remember that part, um, that I listened to my students' stories and that I hope that they knew that they all mattered. Did you want to? <laughs> Hello, I'm Linda Bennell, and I am who I am and what I am because of Clement Good, a professor here at Baylor University who, who made my life. Uh, I have two questions for you. One, I think I know the answer to. You mentioned Dickens. Uh, I'm, I'm not a Victorian. I'm a romanticist, but I have read a few Victorian novels in my lifetime. I want to know how you feel about Dickens and whether he influenced you or not. And the great scene in and the novel, I, it's been many years since I've taught, um, where he's in the balloon and he's over Paris. Do you remember it? It's, it's an extraordinary piece of writing and it opens one. I'm pretty sure it's hard times, but I'm not, I could be very wrong. Uh, Um, so I was mentioning earlier that the two of the American writers who I'm most strongly influenced by are Walter Percy, yes, um, great Catholic novel. Uh, another person who did fiction in my Um, I, I'm really fond of Margaret Atwood. Yeah. Uh, she has yeah. this incredible gift for past and present, and and talking about how it's shaped by our histories. Um, and then um, I mentioned James Baldwin a lot. Uh, in recent years, I've been very strongly influenced by his fiction. And for this book, especially, uh, maybe my favorite of his novels is The Red. The big cast, uh, all of them are sort of given their, uh, their humanity. Uh, and, and that's something that I think Dickens also does really well. The big cast, everybody, you know, got uh, their, their full humanity given to them. But I think maybe just in general, maybe even instead of being, you know, sort of, uh, Inspired by Dickens or by any of these other writers, it's just you know this is what great storytelling does. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it's uh, it takes us on this journey with recognizing the mystery and helps us understand something about our own. Thank you. Thank you.
My other question has to do with the Tocqueville. Did you read or were you influenced by his not his important book, I think, on the French Revolution? I really was. Um, this book <laughs> is so much more an American in Paris. Uh, and you know, even as much time as I've spent in Paris, I'm not fluent in French. Uh, I was admitting earlier that my French is worse now than at any time in my life. Um, but it, this is, it's, I was influenced much more by accounts of Americans in Paris over the centuries. Uh, so that was part of my research. Uh, and there's also actually a history of the cathedral, uh, which is fascinating. Um, and one of the things that's just sort of mentioned in passing, um, the cathedral was the, um, the church for the Wehrmacht during the occupation of Paris. And we were like, oh, that's awful. But two things, because we, we read our history. One, the Nazis put heating in the cathedral. And please be assured, it would be really, really, really terrible to be in this cathedral in January without it. And second, the pastor, the German Lutheran pastor at that time was a member of the German resistance and collaborating with Rommel and some of those other folks. And there's, um, there's so much interesting stuff there that I didn't even get to. Um, so I, I, I left a lot of the French stuff sort of over on the side because it's less pertinent to my characters. Um, still interesting, uh, but just less important in terms of my telling his story. So um, as someone who's never written fiction, how much of the ending did you know at the beginning? All right, and that's a great question. My problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> this, no, this is, this is actually a craft question. Uh, and I talk with my students about this all the time. I almost never start a story where I don't know the ending. I don't have to know the precise ending. So I don't know all the plot elements. I didn't know what was going to happen to all of these major characters, but I knew what the mood was going to be. And then just in a very broad sense, I knew that it was going to be a movement from brokenness to wholeness and from fear to faith. And so I knew I would recognize it when I got there. Um, and then Provost, the other thing that I knew about this book, because um, I've written enough books now that I like to challenge myself a little bit, you know, when, I'm, you know, this time out, I'm going to try and do these things. Um, I wanted to write the end of The Great Gatsby. So one of the greatest endings in American fiction. So we beat on boats against the current. And I was like, that's what I want. I want that mood. I want that, uh, that voice. And that actually helped me go backwards to figure out what Cal's narrative voice was going to be like. Because I knew I was going to come to this point where he was going to come to the end. He was going to be talking about the river and how he's been changed um, by his experience. So that was the one thing that was different about these this book that I had not known before. I had not had a sort of model that I aspired to. And I don't know that I reached that goal. Because as I said, I think the end of The Great Gatsby is one of the, the great lyrical endings of any novel I've ever read. Um, but other than that, I, I needed to know where we were going to end up. And I wanted there to be a circularity to it, because that's another thing, thing that I preach to my students. Uh, great stories are often circular in some way. Um, and that, that live, gives us that sense of, of completion. You know, we talk about having come full circle. So thank you. That was a great question. So I think I'm going to close this out. Um, I want to thank you. This was delightful. Uh, thank you for writing the book, for sharing the book. Thank you for uh, engaging uh, with us this afternoon, even while on leave. <laughs> leave, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I want to thank you all for being here today and also for folks online. Uh, and I want to plug the next Reader Meet the Author, which is a book by uh, Jao Chavez called Migrational Religion, Context and Creativity in the Latinx Diaspora. Here we go. 
Uh, and he will be interviewed by Felipe Hinojosa. And that takes place on Wednesday, November 8th. So mark your calendars. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you again.